good. So welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this residence, uh, the residence of the Consulate General in New York, um, for this panel discussion on what we call irresistible circular society. Very, very happy uh, that you could all make it here this morning and so early. Personally, I find circular architecture, it's both relevant and it's very important. And I also believe that it is no longer a choice or an individual choice to work or think uh, sustainab su sustainably. It's a global urgency. We must go from nice to have to need to have in order to save our planet and our living environment. The UN Climate Report published just recently proves the same. Sustainability and circularity must be a ruling parameter in modern architecture and future contracting if we want to change the trajectory. According to the circular pioneers at the Elling MacArthur Foundation, the circular economy is based on three fundamental questions which is the topic of today's CEU. <coughs> the questions are, what if waste and pollution were never created in the first place? What if the economy was based on using things rather than using them up? What if we could not only protect, but actively improve the environment? And in Denmark, we like to add a fourth one. What if we lived in an irresistible circular society where circularity is an attractive alternative, both as a profitable business model, but also for the end consumers? <laughs> in Denmark, we have a long, proud, sustainable design tradition. And Danes have long adapted to new, innovative architectural design solutions in their everyday lives. For example, the Copenhagen, ski, uh, hill, uh, Copenhagen Hill ski slope built by BIG uh, on a waste facility crossing entertainment with waste management. Another example uh, of intersecting uh, wellness, energy, and waste management is the Yaya Architects Conti Tail Lüders, a parking garage with a sports rooftop park that stores energy from the surrounding buildings, solar panels, and serves as a recycling center for the neighborhood. In short, with creative and holistic design thinking, we can make solutions that actively address the challenges of sustainable modern living. The recently published white paper, which is to find on your chairs, by Creative Denmark, designing the irresistible circular society that Mike and Kelheu will talk much more about in a bit, offers concrete strategies to position circularity as an attractive alternative to traditional ways of building. This white paper highlights various examples of reuse and upcycling in the building industry and I would like to thank you, Mike and Creative Denmark, for taking on this very important subject. Because the circular transition requires innovative thinking and collaboration across borders and across disciplines. For circularity to become irresistible and unavoidable, we need to build communities, innovative partnerships and alliances around circular thinking and development, which the white paper points out. And that's why we're here today, to get inspired by the panel discussion, to talk to each other, and continue the movement towards the irresistible and urgent circular society. I hope you'll enjoy the discussion here today, and I'm thrilled to now give the word to you, Maigen, Kelheu, Executive Director of Creative Denmark. I hope we'll have a wonderful morning. Thank you. <laughs> Hi.
Hi, everyone, and thank you, Beat, for your wise words and for pointing out the need for collaboration when pushing forward the circular transition. My name is Maiken Kjellhede, and I'm the Executive Director of Creative Denmark. And we are delighted to be here today. Creative Denmark is a public-private partnership established between the Danish government on the one side and some of the major business organizations in Denmark on the private side. Uh, we are established to push forward creativity and showcase how creative solutions can push forward the sustainable agenda and help innovate so that the sustainable choices become irresistible and not only functional. So that's what we're here for. Um, we are very pleased to carry out this event in a collaboration with AIA and the General Consulate of Denmark uh, here today and together with the, the Design Pavilion. Today, we are launching our new white paper, Design, oh, it's the other way around. <laughs> Designing the Irresistible Circular Society. The white paper has been established in a collaboration together with the Danish Architecture Center, the Danish Design Center, Blockstop, and many others. The shift to a circular economy has become an integrated part of, uh, of the green transition puzzle in Denmark, in the US, and in many other uh, countries worldwide. And to accelerate this shift, we need these choices to become convincing and compelling in the way that we construct our cities, not only buildings, but our societies at large. And in continuation of this, we are asking questions such as, what if we designed an irresistible circular society where circularity is a clear-cut choice, both in business models as well as for the citizens? What if would the future city look like if we actually adapt to a circular agenda? And how do we make it good business? So that's the question that we want to circle around in our white paper. The white paper has three different perspectives. One being resource loops and zero waste, such as design for disassembly, life cycle assess assessments, and upcycling and circular business models. As an example for this, you could mention maybe, maybe you know Linear Group, which is a Danish-based architectural firm. They have made something called the Resource Rose in Denmark. It's a housing project um, where they have used materials from abandoned houses instead of new materials. And this has actually resulted in a, uh, a CO2 footprint, which was reduced with 70% uh, compared to if you have only used the- Recording in progress. Okay. <laughs> well, good for that. <laughs> we hope somebody will uh, watch it then. Um, the second perspective of the white paper is city nature, resiliency, and biodiversity, because we need to look at what is around our buildings, what's happening in our cities at large. So it's about circular neighborhoods, it's about recycling, and it's about urban nature. Our third perspective in the white paper is social values and communities. We also need, about, uh, need to look into designing for behavioral change, and we need to look into product as a service. So that's our white paper, and I hope that you will enjoy it and read it and reach out if you have any questions or comments. We would love to hear about it. With us today, we have leading industry experts and so, uh, circular thinkers that will share with, with us uh, different thoughts, different ideas about the circular transition uh, and how we can actually use it in, in making our cities irresistible for the future. Please welcome our esteemed panel debate moderator, Amanda Kaminsky, founder and principal of Building Product Ecosystem. She will host the debate and also welcome our, uh, our panelists to the stage. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome, and I'm uh, really pleased to be able to have the opportunity to moderate this panel this morning. Uh, I run a company called Building Product Ecosystems, and we 
do just that. We build product and process and material ecosystems that uh, ideally dovetail with uh, the natural systems that, um, that we're building amidst. And so uh, I was excited to see this white paper being released and uh, again, excited to be able to have this conversation with, uh, with the folks that I'm about to introduce. So um, each panelist is going to give a little bit of an overview of their work and how they uh, interact with and nurture uh, circularity and uh, regenerative systems, uh, restorative systems, and then we will have a discussion. Um, and if you guys have any questions, we'll try to make some time towards the end of that discussion uh, to hear those questions and get them answered as well. So to start, um, and we do have one, one panelist, I believe, who is, um, is calling in as well. So we're gonna start with one of the folks that, oh, there he is. Hi, Cora. <laughs> um, we're gonna start with one of the folks that we have in the room here. Um, we have Tom Kennedy, uh, who is an Arab principal in New York City, and he leads Arab civil engineering skills, foresight and innovation team, and circular economy business for Arab Americas. Um, I'm gonna do, maybe I'll do all the introductions right now real quickly. Uh, Cora, who we have uh, calling in uh, from Copenhagen, is partner and head of innovation at GXN in Copenhagen. And uh, Cora works with applied design research across 3XN Architects and GXN Innovation in the built environment and with a particular focus on circular economy. And then we also have uh, Greg Haley here, also based in New York City. And Greg is an associate principal with Henning Larson, practicing architecture and urban design uh, for the last 20 years. Gregory uh, also teaches and is a design resource member for the Mayor's Institute on City Design. So, uh, Tom, we're going to hand it off to you to start. Thank you. I think we have a couple of slides. So I was told by Amanda very clearly, it was three slides and three minutes. <laughs> there, is, there is no, so I said, okay, five slides and three minutes. Yeah. So let's, let's, skip, the, let's skip the title one. So uh, I, st I started looking at this uh, probably five or six years ago on the basis of uh, something that came to me about the trending of megacities and what that means to me as an engineer uh, professionally, but also uh, looking at New York about how does New York stretch its, its wings a little bit and get bigger uh, without stressing the city to the point of breaking. And so we look at this and you say, yeah, okay, I can, I can relate to most of these places as growth cities. And you're like, sure, okay, and that kind of trends, if we go to the next slide, with what we see in terms of urbanization. The UN did an urbanization study about percentage of the population who are live in cities. And you look at it and you say, yeah, okay, that, that kind of makes sense. But if we look at the areas with lower urbanization and the trending towards urbanization in those areas, next slide, we see that in 2018, that trending for megacities changes a lot. And so we're seeing that it's no longer North America, Northern Europe, it's Africa, it's parts of Asia, um, and it's places where you were like, okay, I uh, didn't think that was gonna be a megacity. But what does that mean for now we've got much more people wanting the new iPhone, got much more people wanting personal vehicles, much more people wanting air conditioning and things that they expect to see in a developed city. How do we deal with that from a materials perspective, an energy perspective, but from the built environment perspective, which is my world? Next slide. The bit that got me the most is last year, while we were all worried about masks and vaccinations and rates and things like that, we had 21 billion dollar plus weather events in the US, a record number. I mean, record number as in it's never been 21 before, but if you go back over the last 10 years, it's been double digits for quite a while. And we've been suffering this and then building back. And we've been building back using techniques that we've known about for years. Oh, because the Army Corps know how to do that. So-and-so knows how to do that. This is how we traditionally build. It's gotta stop, right? We've gotta think about it differently. It can't just be about, well, what does the project cost economically? We need to think about it differently. What does the project cost capital carbon cost, but also operational carbon cost? And so not just in the materials itself, but what are the impacts of that? Slide. 
because the important part is, of our primary, ooh, primary resources uh, globally, 50% goes into new construction. And 40%, 40% of our energy goes into construction. It's a massive number, and that's globally. That's not just in New York City. That is a global number. So think about the energy produced around the world. That's the sort of numbers we're talking about. We can do better. Next slide. So if we want to get to zero emissions, right? That's it. That's absolutely where we should be. We should, we should be. 2020, we're at, we're at the peak if we're to believe it. But our population's growing as well. So there's going to be. It's not going to be a triangular diagram. It's going to be some nebulous wave as we learn about uh, zero carbon uh, and how we deal with it, it deal with waste and issues. But if we want to get to zero by here, 2050, with an increasing population, we're doubling down on the things we have to do to change what we do now for the future. Next slide. So if anyone in the room thinks that sustainability is enough, it's not. We need to go beyond. Sustainability will take us to a <coughs> we're doing no more <coughs> harm scenario. We need to go beyond. We need to look at restorative design. And where I'm spending most of my time right now is looking at regenerative design. How do we get to a place where we can allow the planet to start healing itself? Because we're not enough to do it, so we need help, and we need help from the planet that we live on. I think, oh, so then the final thing was uh, just to quantify it. By 2050, we're, if we carry on where we are, we're at 51 billion tons of carbon into the CO2 into the atmosphere every year. 51 billion tons. This is within our control. So 28 billion tons of that is energy efficiency, it's energy production, it's things we can do, choices we make using technology we have today. Of the remaining 23, 13 is choices that we make. So the, the things we do, technology that's available to us now, do we employ it? How do we deploy it? Great example we were talking about earlier was over the last year, we've been insistent that we need to go around and see our clients, and we fly everywhere and we do that. That's gone, right? So now we're on Zoom, we're on Teams calls. Our carbon footprint has reduced dramatically. Are we a worse off society because we're not getting on an airplane and spending two hours trying to get through security and then on an airplane and the same at the other end? No. We're probably a little more productive, but we don't have the face-to-face. -face. We as humans need to get used to that. So that's in the 13 billion tons. The last bit, the 10 billion tons, that's our choices and that's circular economy. And that's why it's important. Because we've got 10 billion tons. We collectively have 10 billion tons of choices to make. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Cora. Yes, let me just share my screen. Uh, second, I was also told uh, uh, screen sharing is disabled. Should I? Um, can you share the screen from where you are, Rebecca? Is that coming through? Yes. Okay. Well, let me start by introducing myself. So I was also told three slides by Amanda. And just as Tom was thinking, I was thinking, okay, four. Uh, I can do four slides and, and talk about some of the projects that we're doing. But I also want to thank Tom for bringing those extra slides and, and so eloquently talking about the challenge we're facing and the choices that we're having to make. I mean, this makes the context of what I'm trying to explain quite a bit easier. Amanda, um, Amanda are you sharing my slides on the screen now? Yes. Excellent. So the first slide, the title slide here. So I'm coming from 3X and Architects and GX and Innovation. We are an architecture company and a research company sharing uh, offices in Copenhagen, in New York, in London, in Sydney, and in Stockholm. And what that constellation of an architecture company and research company allows us to do is, is look at the challenges that we are facing uh, from quite different angles. So what we get to do in GXN is that we get to develop and drive research projects with universities or with uh, different partners in the built environment to explore uh, some of the challenges that we're facing in an environment where the risks of normal building projects are not really present because of the research funding we can get. And then through that, we can learn and scale up ideas that we have 
with three excellent architects where we're working with uh, project uh, architects, projects, construction clients, and, and project teams. And that constellation has allowed us to work with the circular economy for the better part of a decade. And you can see some of the projects we've been working on on that slide. If you go to the next one, I just brought three examples of how we're working with this presently. So this project you're seeing a few images from here is a research project called Circuit. It's a large scale project where we are looking at the challenges and obstacles to introducing flexible and circular design in four cities. So these cities are Copenhagen, Hamburg, London and Helsinki. And in the projects, we're working both with municipal stakeholders to understand the context of the cities and how they're working, but also with the local construction stakeholders and value chains to understand how we can drive through chains uh, with the partners that are already there. I think one of the interesting things with the circular economy is that the knowledge is very much local, but the solutions are often, uh, or the knowledge is very much global, sorry, but the solutions are often local in that they have to introduce and bring in partners from the local construction climates. And that's, that's really the bridge we're trying to, uh, the gap we're trying to bridge with this project. So the way we do that is by developing uh, 12 demonstrators, so three across each city, for how circular and flexible construction can impact housing. So we are developing actual housing projects where we are introducing design for disassembly at scale, looking at how to uh, create housing where we can change layout, uh, introduce new types of uh, housing requirements, maybe even change function down the way if we need something other than housing in these spaces. And we're also then working with the cities to look at which roadmaps we need to put in place in terms of developing policy and, and stakeholder networks to introduce this at a larger scale. And also then working with the private stakeholders to figure out how we can start documenting the value of these things. So we're both looking at the value in terms of uh, carbon reductions. We're looking at the value in terms of utility of buildings and, and prolonged building life, but also the monetary value of having buildings that you can adapt to different uses uh, in their lifetime. So we go to the next slide. This slide is a uh, 3XN project. It's the key quarter tower in Sydney. It's an example of how we can scale up what we know uh, from the circular economy to really drive value in uh, projects. So uh, the project is a high rise that's built on the side of a, another high rise in, in, in the harbor in Sydney, as so many buildings are. Uh, they're very rarely greenfield sites. Most of them are brownfield. We will have existing buildings on site. And for this specific project, the team worked with the city of Sydney, with the engineers, which I believe were Arab in this case, uh, and with the developer to try and maintain as much of the existing tower as possible. Um, and so what we did was we basically stripped the front of the tower away and utilized the superstructure as a superstructure for the new tower, thereby saving 50% of the materials that we needed for the new tower. At the same time, we were saving quite a bit of uh, embodied carbon. So one of the key challenges that Tom were bringing up, the carbon that we have uh, baked into our materials when we're producing them, cement, for example, being a key uh, problem here. And so we were saving 7,500 tons of embodied carbon uh, with this specific tower. But just as importantly, we were saving the client a lot of money. So we were saving 95 uh, million US dollars. Uh, which was saved not just in terms of the materials used, but also in terms of, of time, reduced demolition program and reduced construction program. And so this is an example of, of the value that these kind of choices can make and the importance also of bringing that value in if you want to really drive change through the industry. And so on the last slide, uh, we have another project that we're working on right now. This is to Finsbury Avenue. It's a tower project in London near Liverpool Street Station. And in this project, we have a number of different solutions integrated. And we're doing this with a very ambitious client who have developed a sustainability brief for the project where they are focusing very, very uh, aggressively on carbon. So both embodied carbon and operational carbon, but also on circular economy metrics, uh, such as uh, the amount of uh, reuse materials versus virgin materials, or the amount of material that we are diverting, not just from landfill, but actually upcycling versus the amount of material we're downcycling uh, in terms of waste. And so that means that we've had to go in and again, work quite uh, significantly with the buildings on site and do a pre-demolition audit, uh, clarify which resources we could harvest from the buildings. And now we're working with local value chains in and around London to see how we can turn these resources into new products that we can either use in these towns or use in other projects. 
And so to, to wrap up, uh, I think that sort of the key challenges that we're facing, Tom talked about the planetary issues here. From an industry perspective, what we are required to do now is finding ways of making sure that we document the value of these decisions and make them make sense for the people who are making them. That means that we need to figure out what the financial value of making these decisions are. And, and luckily, we're seeing a lot of moves in the markets around this now. We need to start working more on having the data uh, required to do this, also working with building material passports, which is something I hope we can, can discuss. And of course, we got to build the partnerships, both in terms of the project partnerships and the trust required within projects to experiment, but also the wider partnerships, uh, which are local in terms of developing the value chains to meet the needs of, of the market. Thank you, Cora. Uh, now we're going to hear from uh, Greg. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you, and it's great to be here. My name is Greg Haley. I'm an associate principal with Henning Larson. Uh, and I want to talk about, uh, I, now I expected three slides, so they're a little bit crowded, so forgive me for the. Uh, but I, I'm going to talk about three projects three that were um, completed by my colleagues in the Copenhagen office. Uh, and when I started thinking about this, I, I went back to a couple ideas from a piece that was written by Jakob Strauman Anderson, who's our one of our partners and, and director of innovation and sustainability, which was that the most sustainable building is the one that's never built, and that the most sustainable city is the one that never sleeps. And I thought those were really kind of two very interesting ideas that I kind of started with when kind of looking through some of the research and projects that we've done. The first one, starting here, this school in Fredericksburg, um, I have kind of two things I want to talk about. One is upcycling, and the other is activation around the clock. So this is one of four projects that in the Copenhagen office we've done using recycled bricks, upscaling bricks, cleaning them, rinsing them off, and reusing them. So this has some 400,000 bricks that were used, that often that much of which came from nearby. So in a way, it's also a very interesting way to create beautiful texture, but also to really tie it into its context and its history in an unusual way as well. So that's one of the things about this project that I think is really interesting. And you can see also the reduction in carbon is, is, is really striking uh, when you're reusing uh, brick rather than using new brick. The other, the other aspect of this project was um, from the beginning a concerted effort with the stakeholders and with the client looking at uh, how the building is used and really trying to use that space uh, as much as it can be. So you're really figuring out all the different things that could happen there. There's a school, uh, K through nine, there's a daycare, there's after school clubs that use it. It's a community center in the evenings and the weekends. So using that building as much as possible. And this graph at the bottom was a study that was done also by our, our Copenhagen group. We do a lot of post-occupancy studies about how the buildings function, and, um, about looking at the, the energy use uh, compared to if it was separate buildings that were providing those same functions. And uh, while there's more energy, it's much greater uh, re you know, re reduction from where it would be as multiple buildings. The next slide, please. The next slide, another school, um, and this was a, a, another partnership with, with a community uh, looking at, um, looking at a, in addition to a school uh, in Felsbala, and the beginning of this was the question of could we create a project that sequesters more carbon than it, than it adds in the building process? Uh, and it then began a, a process of looking beyond kind of what you would normally think of as your traditional building materials to biomass uh, and using straw prefabricated panels that could also then be easily disassembled, et cetera. Uh, and the kind of simplicity of the architecture um, that, that comes with that, um, but also at a great reduction in, in, in the carbon um, and sequestering the carbon that, that, that was a great improvements. Third slide, please. And then the third one um, is two things. I think it's, it's square meters as a resource, so going back to the how do we use what we have. Uh, so many buildings built that are a great in, you know, expenditure and resource uh, and, uh, and, 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 and carbon, and how do we make the most out of that. Um, this was a, and also how you work with community to improve those things. So this was a strategic partnership that was a coalition of architects, engineers, contractors, uh, and, 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 and fabricators working with uh, nonprofit housing associations to develop how to improve the housing, both to deal with deferred maintenance, but also to improve energy performance. So we worked with, uh, with a group, including academic partners, to develop a, a recladding system that was designed, prefabricated, designed for disassembly, 
But I think one of the other interesting aspects of this was designing it as a kind of kit of parts that became a catalog that then really engaged the community and having agency uh, in, in determining what their building was gonna look like. So they had, they had participation in that. And I think one of the things that I find really interesting in, in the white paper is that idea of, of community engagement uh, and community involvement because I think that idea of making it irresistible also hinges on the idea that it's gonna give me some agency. It gives me some choice in some way. I think if we can find that, I think that's a, a, a real win. Thank you. Okay. Uh, cut you off. I know that uh, the connection was a little bit bad for a second there, so I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> um, so I'm interested, uh, Tom, to for, uh, maybe hear a little bit more about, there's so much different terminology, right, that's used. There's resilience, there's sustainability, there's circularity, there's uh, restorative and regenerative systems. Uh, can you say a little bit about where you think we're at right now? And uh, is all of this uh, part of a continuum or are they distinct terms? Sure. So, um, I <laughs> this is gonna be unpopular, <laughs> right? Because we, <laughs> are, we all like to think we're at the sustainability point. That if we continue the way we're going, we're gonna do no harm, no more harm, it's done. That's not true. We are not yet at sustainability. As, as a society, as New York, Americas, the globe, we're not there. We could be, but we've got hard choices to make. Um, going past that to uh, restorative uh, means we do things like um, we were talking about earlier about putting rooftop gardens in. So taking the local law in New York that's a green roof or photovoltaics and saying, okay, that's the minimum we could do, and that's what we have to do by code, well, that's great. Uh, but we can do more. We can think about how we use that space. What else does it do? Can we make it a community space? Can we link things together to have a bigger impact so that more people use it? The more people use things, the more agency. Greg was talking absolutely correctly about agency and people owning spaces. That's what we need to get to. Um, but So going beyond that of, re of uh, rest restorative, and allowing systems to help themselves. So our national US waterways, we've helped them be restorative. We've, we've sort of got them back to fairly clean. New York waterways has a tremendously, I, I think it's hilarious, the way they talk about the cleanliness of the water. Don't swim. Swim, but don't eat the, the fish. <laughs> eat the fish, don't eat the shellfish. Eat the shellfish. Right, so that that's the that's the classic way, and it's it's a very I mean it's clever because it's and it's comical, but it's simple. It's simple. People can understand those terms. If you said don't do it because the biological oxygen demand is too high, it's like what, 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 right? But that's what they're getting at. That's the levels that we're going to. So that that's a great example of restorative. We've moved a long way in the last 15 years about the cleanliness of New York's water supply, but regenerative means that we, we're going further and we're saying, do we really have to do some of this? Can we not return space to the natural world, allow the world to come back? So there's a push at COP26 right now for the, the countries with rainforest to stop harvesting rainforest and allowing them to come back. That's restorative. But there's other measures we can make in how we live our society of how we let uh, nature into what we do. Do we really have to have manicured lawns everywhere? Could we allow, just for a moment, Central Park to have areas where we just allow it to be nature? Heresy, absolute heresy, <laughs> right? Because we, we as people expect lawns to be manicured. We expect dead wood and trees to be removed because it's unsightly, right? But they have a social value to an ecosystem that's not us, right? So. I think we need to get beyond ourselves in order to do what's right for the planet we live on. So uh, the, the, the one word I would say, Amanda, to summarize what you were, you were talking about is we need to be precise with the words that we use and understand what they mean. 
uh, sustainability has become this greenwash of, oh, that's very sustainable. Is it? What do you mean by that? Are you counting carbon? Are you thinking about how much waste it's producing? What's the metric you are defining sustainable by? And what does it mean to you? And how much are you willing to do to change what the word sustainability means to you? Thank you. I think that um, that is very um, on point. Um, and I think you're right that people are very loose with their words. Um, I'm wondering uh, further to the discussion about metrics, uh, Cara, if you can talk a little bit about the metrics that you're using uh, in uh, valuing all these different aspects. I mean, uh, nurturing circularity is, I think it feels overwhelming to a lot of people. And I think especially getting to a, a place where uh, circularity is irresistible and fundamental and the norm uh, requires compelling people uh, to act in different ways than they're acting right now. And so I'm wondering, uh, I, I definitely want to hear a little bit about how you're utilizing materials passports. And uh, for us, I think uh, here, very frequently, it's sort of a theoretical thing uh, that people keep talking about. But uh, very rarely do we see them manifest themselves on projects. And so I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how you're using um, data on waste, carbon, and uh, whole system health, really, because all of these are really important to getting towards all of these terms that Tom just spoke to. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, uh, and, and thank you for the question. So, so two things in there. One has to do with the metrics, maybe the other one with the with the building material passports. The most exciting thing that I've seen in the last five years is is, is this notion of going beyond sustainability, going beyond the minimal requirements, and really trying to think about what it is that we need to do to have something that's not just sustainable but regenerative. Uh, in different ways. And we are seeing that push right now in, in the market in specifically in, in European cities. So we can see that here in Copenhagen and we can definitely see it in London. And what's happening there is that, that even though we have frameworks within the cities, we also have now big tenants going to big developers and asking them point blank, what are you doing about circular economy with this project? How are you dealing with the waste that this project is gonna deal, uh, produce? What are you doing for embodied and operational carbon, which is quite new. Uh, but that drive is really coming from the market and is having to do with that larger transition that I think Tom was talking to. And so the big question then becomes, what are we, what are we talking about when we're talking about these things and how do we document it? So some of the key things that we're looking at right now is uh, what we are calling carbon transparency. So that is the notion that we want to be looking at embodied carbon, the carbon in the materials we're utilizing in buildings and operational carbon. And we want to do that in a life cycle perspective. So we want to look at the construction phase, the use phase and the end of life phase. Um, and in order to do this normally or at the moment, we are seeing some projects that have LCA life cycle carbon uh, studies done and, and we sort of get a number out. So this project has uh, 600 kilograms of embodied carbon per square meter or whatever it is. That number is still quite opaque. So what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, carbon transparency is, is the notion of let's not just share the number, but let's share the model. Let's open source the work we did to get to that number, the assumptions that we made and the hard decisions and choices that we had to make on one side. And once we start generating that data, let's also start thinking about what value that data can bring, not just to a developer and a developer portfolio, but also to tenants. So we are seeing uh, in, in London, for example, tenants getting ready to do ESG reporting, undoubtedly pushed by some of the stuff that's happening at COP and other places, but reporting on their uh, environmental, uh, social and governance impacts of, of their work. And so what we're working with right now is figuring out how we can collect data about the performance of buildings and make that available to tenants so that they can pull the data that they need uh, for their um, their own reporting. And so material passports is, is, is one way of doing that. So what we're talking about when we're talking about material passports are building material passports. So it's a passport that collects information on all the materials we're putting into a building, uh, where the materials are from, how they're put together, what products they are, what composition they have, if we can get down to that level. That information is, is then stored. And so one of the key problems with the building material passport is finding a way to store that information or that data uh, in, in the long term. So we're working with a, um, a supplier or a, a database supplier or cloud-based service supplier rather called Medasta from the Netherlands, who've set up a system where you can upload your, your data um, 
And based on that, we can then begin to start developing uh, circularity metrics. So metrics where we, for example, are evaluating how much of a building or a facade of a building or other component of a building is designed for disassembly. And we can give that as a percentage out of out of 100, from for zero to 100%. But we're also starting looking at uh, how much of your uh, building is utilizing um, reused or recycled or upcycled components versus virgin components. How much of your building is, if, if we're looking at the waste side of things, how much waste are we actually directing into new life cycles in terms of upcycling versus downcycling uh, and, and so on? There's still a lot of work that needs to go into this. Uh, there's a lot of trade-offs that has to happen. Uh, we got to understand in terms of how much data is enough. If we just have the approach that we want to get all the data all the time, we are quickly going to run into projects where issues with project economy. We're also thinking about what is the use cases once we have that data. And, and, and all of that is happening around the material passports. So just to give you an example, if we collect this information around carbon transparency, for example, or around the carbon loads, we think we have a use case of working with the tenants in terms of giving them numbers for their reporting. But if we can collect information around the materials in a fit out, for example, we also believe we have a use case in terms of having a smarter asset management of these materials and products in the fit out, which we can then actually ensure that we utilize to create second lives. Uh, if you're looking at embodied carbon, the fit out is responsible for almost half of the carbon of a building's lifetime and is responsible for that much since uh, it is changed so often. It's changed on average every eight years. A lot of that fit out materials is going into the skip. And what we're looking at right now is if we can utilize material passports to create transparency around what we have in our fit outs so that we can enable second lives for them. Fantastic. Um, I'm wondering how frequently those uh, passports are able to be applied to uh, buildings in situ, like buildings that um, are currently in place uh, rather than. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems if products are you know, just coming off of manufacturing, it's much easier probably to understand all of their composition, the health of that composition, uh, all, all of the different characteristics, right? So uh, how frequently are you seeing pa material passports being applied to <laughs> buildings and products that are in place out in a building right now? Yeah, th that, that's a great question. I mean, one of the key problems we have in terms of, in general, transparency about the built environment is an understanding of what is already out there and, and, and thinking about how we can work with that. So we haven't really seen many cases. I know of a case where Medasta uh, used it with uh, Schiphol Airport, where they had a building that they needed to move because they were extending a runway and were using the material passport to document the building and then adding that documentation into the tender. Uh, telling the contractors bidding on uh, the demolition of that building that they were basically looking at who could reutilize most of the resources that they could find in the passport. And in the end, the guys who won or the company who won the bid ended up not uh, asking for any money, but actually paid, I think, symbolically one euro for the building because they could see the documentation in the passport that they could then sell the building and put it up somewhere else. That's a very sort of specific case. But what we have done and what we are doing when we're looking at existing buildings that we are going to be uh, tearing down or changing or adapting, we are starting to introduce these uh, what we call circular pre-demolition audits, which right now means going into the building and documenting uh, all the materials, finding the drawing materials that we can, but also visiting the building, uh, testing out the different materials and creating a log of that and then start thinking about what we can do with it. But it's quite an analog process right now. And I think the exciting next step is going to figure out how we can digitize that more. I'd love to stay in touch on that. That sounds really interesting. That's great to hear. Um, Greg, I know that uh, you've done a lot of work um, at the city scale, and I'm kind of curious and, and really excited to hear about the optimizing of the asset uh, use over 24-hour cycles, um, and how how do you think we can be doing more of that? Um, is it uh, through potentially uh, collaboration of uh, governments, uh, municipalities with architects and private uh, building owners as well? Uh, can we be doing anything in policy to get uh, more of that nurtured? Um, th it it kind of sometimes it seems takes getting past uh, some discomfort for people to open up their buildings more broadly to other uses. And so I'm just kind of curious what your experience has been. Right, yeah, no, I think you're right. It, it definitely to make those kinds of changes will require a really kind of broad kind of coalition that involves designers and policy and all of those things, right? I mean, and some of it is also, um, zoning and opening up the way we think about where uses go and how they relate to others, right? And I think 
in the same spirit of kind of just reusing and utilizing resources we already have as much as possible, you know, the, the, the idea of, you know, both in, say, suburban areas, retrofitting and, and density, right, that you kind of can create in there. So that's a change in zoning. Uh, I think in, in cities, changing of use so that you can create real 15-minute neighborhoods where people are able to get the things they need and not have to take transit so much, right? I, I think the other thing in both of those cases is really tying it to the sense that urban life can be delightful, <laughs> right? And, and how can, by adding those things, being able to somehow uh, uh, make evident that making those changes improves, improves life, improves safety, improves so many different metrics, improves, improves health, mm -hmm. right? So it's a matter of also getting involved uh, academics and researchers to understand all those metrics. I think the whole discussion about metrics and understanding that and making that uh, um, really easily digestible to people is, is just super, super uh, important. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'll, I just, I'll just add on that. I think the, the other thing that I think is <laughs> really valuable, especially in the U.S. context, I think is that thinking th in things that way also just creates this sen a, a greater sense of us right, a greater sense of commonality. Uh, and I think um, that goes a long way in, in helping solve a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good example. I feel like our library system is very right. good here right. on, along those lines, the, right. the way the libraries get used for community events and uh, for their core purpose, but uh, yeah. Right, right, yeah. right, right, absolutely, yeah. Great, um, I think uh, we're gonna have to wrap up the panel. I know I teased you guys and said you could ask questions, but I, we can mingle afterwards and ask, uh, questions of our panelists, and I guess we'll have to email you, Cora. <laughs> um, but we have your information. Um, so thank you, um, everybody. Uh, thanks for all of your insights. Yeah, thank you. So thank you so much, Amanda, and our esteemed panelists for a lively discussion and for pointing out some of the challenges, but also some of the solutions in us getting, uh, getting ahead in a more sustainable future. Next up, we have Tone Søndergaard from the Danish Clean Tech Hub, who's also founding director of the uh, Circular City Week here in New York. Tone? There you are. I'm just <laughs> trying to find you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maiden. Um, and thank you so much for everyone listening in today. I completely agree. What a lovely panel. Uh, favorite folks uh, in the panel that also uh, frequently visit uh, Circular City Week New York. So for sure, uh, keep an eye out for them there. Uh, as Mike so rightly say, my name is Tone Søndergaard, and I'm the director of the Danish Clean Tech Hub here in New York City. We are a public-private partnership founded by the Confederation of Danish Industry and State of Green. Um, and as part of that work, we have also started Circular City Week New York. And we did that precisely because we are so dedicated to this concept of knowledge sharing, solution sharing, and creating partnerships across the Atlantic. And I think our panelists today have like completely hit on the point why it's so important to have a Circular City Week in New York to facilitate these conversations and to truly kind of progress the, the partnerships. Uh, a little bit about Circular City Week, it is an open collaborative festival, meaning that everyone who wants to host an event and be part of Circular City Week can do so. Um, in 2022, it will take place from the 21st to the 27th of March, and that will be the fourth time we're doing it. In the spirit of this new world we're living in, it will be a hybrid festival. It will be both in person, hopefully, with a lot of things taking place here in New York, but also, of course, virtually. Um, in 2021, so this year, we had more than 90 events taking place during the week, which was amazing. Uh, 8,000 people tuning in to listen to some of the many events that took place, um, and all made possible by more than 250 different partners, organizations, that are essentially creating the festival. Um, and the built environment and the design space is really an important part of the festival as well. It makes up around a third of all the activities that takes place. So I really do hope to uh, see a lot of you also in March to continue some of these conversations. Um, a few points that I think was really important from today's discussion as well is, and, and why Circular City Week is also what we think is, is an important vehicle to make this happen, of course, is that, that, that what, for instance, Cor said is like, 
stakeholders and doing circular economy in practice has to be localized, but it can truly be inspired by what goes on other places in the world as well. And, and we think that is such an important part of what it is that Circular City Week is really dedicated to do. Um, there was also a lot of talk about metrics today, and I think that's important both when we talk about the built environment, but also wider in terms of why New York is such an amazing place to talk about circular economy. And quite a few of us who was in the room was also part of this like uh, initiative that were trying to study the effects of implementing more circular economy in the city of New York. And it actually came out with some really interesting figures, being that implementing fairly sort of like um, interesting and, and but still very well proven circular economy uh, initiatives would create more than 11,000 jobs here in the city of New York um, and 11 billion in economic benefits. So just to say we are also in New York City really sort of gearing up on, on the data part of things and, and justifying why circular economy really has something to offer. Um, a few things in terms of, I read the lovely white paper. So I will say, I think there's a great quote in there as well, which is the need for circular economy is becoming so obvious that there is no need to argue it anymore. Instead, our focus can be dedicated on how to prepare for success and develop solutions. I think I'll make that the model for like Circular City Week New York. Um, so that's really amazing. So I, I really urge all of you to, to look through the white paper and maybe see if you can find that one quote somewhere in there. Um, also completely in the spirit and the last thing I will say uh, of what you have been talking about, it is really sort of, you call it agency today. In Circular City Week, we have called it activation. But we've really seen a development in terms of circular economy over the last four years where we've been hosting this festival to move from discussing what is circular economy to then talking about some of the small projects and pilots that were sort of taking place all over the world to now truly talking about scale and implementation and how to get people activated within the space of circular economy. So uh, I hope all of you will be joining us either as attendees, as hosts, as pioneers, uh, during Circular City Week uh, in the spring and, uh, and talk about precisely how to activate, how to create this very important agency. So thank you so much for having me today. And uh, thank you for a great discussion. Thank you so much, Tone, and congratulations with your important work in pushing forward the discussion on um, circular economy. Last up, I have the pleasure of introducing Garrett Johnson from the Consulate General here in New York, who will do the closing remarks. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, and thank you to our partners, uh, Creative Denmark, uh, Design Pavilion, New York City by Design, and the AIA. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this discussion. It was extremely inspiring. And Tony, you took almost all of the ideas I wanted to highlight out of my <laughs> mouth. Um, <laughs> But I do want to emphasize again what Tom Kennedy said about having 10 billion tons of choices um, and that it's cross-cultural, localized collaboration um, and that putting this information into succinct, easy, digestible bits so that uh, globally we can collaborate is, is a major point I think we were talking about earlier in our conversation. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming. We are uh, continuing this initiative. Uh, I hope you'll join us for more CEUs in the future. We're in 2022 launching Danish Design Link, which will also provide additional information on sustainability, circularity, and the designed environment. Um, and uh, I also want to let you know this is recorded, and it will be available to all of you again to review later, and it will be available on the Design Pavilion website as well as the AIA. So thanks again.